Okay, yeah, predictive simulation to check the fit of time series model. So this is interesting, going to time series. Yeah, the distribution just depends on earlier data. So he's looking at the first order auto regression. So just basically what happened last year, does it predict this year? You can see the data, he's got 47, 48, and the unemployment rate. And then they do add your lag. And based on that, you could fit Y to Y lag. He's using BRM. And then we do the model summary. So what do we find out? Well, we do have the coefficient here. Seems to be uh, fairly significant, uh, at least, you know, confidence interval. Well, it's the positive. Um, and then he says down here, uh, simulate with replicated data sets. I'm not nimble enough with the kind of workflow to translate the simulation code into tidyverse style. So we'll follow along with text for the first couple of blocks. So he says, first we set constants and pull posterior draws. So we'd say, how many rows do we have? Um, we do this right here, sims as matrix. So that's basically, you know, all our values that we got out. And n sims is the number of rows of this. So there's 4,000 because it does the fourth. Yeah, when you do this, it gets you 4,000 uh, estimates. Um, let's see, what's going on here? So here he says, okay, for the number of simulations, 4,000. Um, N being the number of rows for unemployment. And let's kind of go through what is this code doing? So for S and so for all the sims, uh, the 4,000, we say Y for this, reps S1 is the unemployment value. And then we pull in the B intercepts, uh, the B co beta coefficient for Y lag, and then the sigma. Okay, so what have we done, he says. Um, what does Y rep look like? Uh, y rep is, 4,000 rows, 70 columns. The 70 columns being the numbers of rows for the unemployment. Um, let's see, so then we make this figure. What is he doing here? So he's pulling the unemployment and year. What is, what is set names actually? I'm not familiar with this one. What is he doing right here? Oh, um, <clears throat> uh, set names. I think, um, I should know that. I don't know what that is. Do we want to look it up real quick? Maybe. <laughs> we oh, I, I, I am looking it up, yeah. Okay, you're looking it up. Okay, good, good. Okay, while you're doing that, yeah, this is clearly just setting the, these names for the iterations. It's just creating the, um, so, so what it does is it takes the uh, data frame in and then yeah. it, um, so he's taken the names from unemployment and year. Oh, okay. um, uh, Or he's pulled those and set them as the names for the data frame. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, data frame set name, mutate, blah, blah, blah. Uh, slice sample, n equals 15, pivot longer, everything except iteration, values 2y, here equals name as double, k 
Okay. Oh, I see. All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, okay. So what is he? Okay. So yeah, that's the year. And so year and Y is our Y. Uh, so what is this show, I guess? So yeah, we maybe didn't need to go through this line by line, but why not? Um, so yeah, he uses facet wrap. So he doesn't see all the different simulations. And there's actually quite a variation in them <laughs> to me. I, I That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, the, the argument he puts into the book, uh, sorry, that is in the book is, uh, where is it? Um, I'm looking at this now. Basically, what they're saying is it doesn't really matter that it doesn't look perfect. The main thing is to understand whether um, is is to see why it is that our simulations are different. Um, so, have we created a bad simulation, or um, what elements of our simulation work and what elements don't? Ah, uh, right. I'm looking at I'm looking at the book now as well. Was the precise phrasing is um, the actual unemployment series features oh, twenty six switches, uh, so that's got, like switching up and down. In this mm -hmm. case, ninety nine percent of uh, n sim equals four thousand replications had more than twenty six switches, with eighty percent of them having a range of switches between twenty sorry thirty one and forty one, implying that this aspect of the data was not clearly captured well by the model. The point of this oh. test is not to reject the auto regression. Uh, no model is perfect after all, but rather to see that this particular aspect of the data, its smoothness, is not well captured by the fitted model. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing that. I, I had circled that last time when I read it. Okay, yeah, so the real time series switch direction much less frequency than would be expected. Yeah, okay. All right. So, but I mean, that goes back to just the general concept of simu yeah, using the simulations to get a sense of kind of how well your model is reflecting what's happening. Yeah, I mean, in, it's not great. <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, even just looking at it, you think, eh, not so good. Um, but yeah, looking at that specifically, you could say, yeah, that's not too good. I think the thing is autoregressive models tend to be, uh, you know, it's a very simple model. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and, yeah. You know, you'd need to pull out all the different lags and the cyclic information in order to get a better replication. Right. Um, uh, you know, simulating time series in itself is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what, uh, was it time series base is all about, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. Was it? Yeah. And getting probability uh, clouds, I guess. Well, I've got a really good example of that. Um, yeah. Where is it? Um, it's by one of the people who's on the business science uh, Slack, created um, his own thing. Well, it. there's a business science Slack. I need to make a point of joining that, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, there's two, um, the, but one of them for the learning lab stuff and the other one for another one. But um, uh, so this okay. website, I'm just adding it to the chat. Uh, this um, is so Alberto helps um, Matt make some of the stuff on business science, but he particularly has like worked on the um, Bayesian, um, the Bayesian time series stuff. Oh, okay. Um, so he's got a. Um, he's got a particular blog on that. Uh, oh, I scroll, see. Yeah. Scroll cool. down. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see there's a Bayesian structural models, and it just goes oh. through the process mm. of like building those models. Um, oh, so he did, he's replicating another blog post, but using the Bayes models and BSTS. Yeah. yeah. And. It, it's pretty it's pretty cool to be honest <laughs> yeah. i will flag this to read hmm so yeah you can see here i mean i wouldn't necessarily uh, at this moment in time it's still computationally quite expensive mm -hmm. to some other approaches like you know trees based is fa faster but you know, you look at the bottom, in fact, the one where you're at, you can see that it captures trend really well. 
you know, the main trend. Oh, yeah. And uh, again, I, I think he says at the top that um, the idea here isn't to get a perfect model, but to demonstrate how it works uh, because okay. getting good model requires a lot of feature engineering. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'll take a look at that for sure. Here's my rendering. Let's go back to the screen. Yeah, sorry, that was tangent. <laughs> That's fine, tangent. It's all right. Um, where was my? Yeah. Bring your shared window to the front. It says, "I will as soon as I find it." Too many things open. Here we go. Here, oh, that's not it. Sorry. So it's not twelve; it's eleven. Then we do that. Dech. <laughs> I think I lost. I've lost my own one. Okay, here we go. Um, oh, there we go. All right, all right, very nice. Okay, so da, da, da. oh, good. Now we gotta go down to eleven. Thank you for your patience, everyone. All right, so physical and numerical comparisons are replicated to actual data. So he says, test. Oh, so he's actually saying, let's assess the jaggedness of the time series uh, in terms of frequency of switches. So, how are we doing that? So, we say we have the function y, the length, lag, lag two, um, sum of the sine of y minus y lag not equal to this. So I, I guess that's just the way he's counting the switches um, back and forth. So we can use this within the context of base plot. So this PPC stat is, is pretty neat. I noticed that, that they use that for, yeah, this base plot. So it's saying, okay, so what have we got? We've got Y is unemployment, Y, Y rep is Y rep. Uh, status test, and then bin width is one. So it, it's showing us the distribution of the um, of the number of simulations with um, based on the frequency of the information, frequency right. of the changes. How, how many uh, switches? I, yeah, yeah. Or ch I suppose, it, like typically speaking, you call them change points. Change points. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, you can see that it is followed a Gaussian distribution because that's what's been selected, and right. then in the actual data, it's like quite far off. It's way, yeah, way over in the tail. Um, yeah, so in the text, which you know you just referenced, Gilman et al. wrote 99% of the simulated data sets had test values higher than the one, and this seems to cohere. So they say, okay, well, why don't we see what the precise percentage is? Um, and yeah, essentially they're just going through and then counting. So just 100 times mean greater than Y. Oh, 99.3, oh dear. Uh, so then they say, yeah, this is interesting. Uh, median QI function, which is giving us the lower upper and the width. That's nice. See, it's good to read these things because you pick up little code snippets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so here it's saying, yeah, so lower to upper 31 to 42. Yeah, so pretty far outside of what we saw in practice. Um, so yeah, this, this was not captured well by the model. Okay, yes, that's true. Um, so yeah, so that's that example. Okay, so now we talk about residual standard deviation sigma, which summarizes the scale of the residuals. In the children's test scores, we had 18, which tells us they can predict scores to an accuracy of 18 points. The measure of the average distance each observation falls from its prediction. We were essentially That's talking about this in the uh, introduction yeah. to statistical learning earlier. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's was, good. Because the size of the um, standard errors or the, you know, or the variance in your beta values yeah. um, 
um, is contextualized by the um, what's it by the overall uh, variance captured in the model. Is it, sorry, the uh, overall. Hang on, wait. Oh, crap, can't remember. Can't remember. my brain's like a sieve. Oh no. So let's see. So we say children test scores example is 10-3. So that's the one we've been through many times. We had the mom going to high school. What's the mom's IQ? And then here's our sigma was about 18. Uh, so here he's got, we could get another sense of what this means with predict. So it's just saying do the prediction based on M10.3 and what is the head. So it, it shows you, um, here's the estimate, here's the estimate there. So you get your, you know, 2.5% to 97.5%. Uh, yeah, so that's what that's doing. The, the values in estimated error column are all just about 18. And yeah, so they could predict to about an accuracy of 18 points. Some a little higher, some a little lower. Um, Okay, so what's next? So, okay, the classic formula for R squared, one minus sigma squared over SY squared, where SY squared is the variance in the sample data. So yeah, so we would want sigma squared obviously to be small <laughs> because we want R squared to be as big as we can. Uh, so although our Bayesian isn't a classical model, we might practice in southern posterior median to compute R squared by hand. So what do we get? Um, he's doing that. Summarize the median sigma squared. Uh, let's see. Posterior samples is, yeah, that always happens. So what is one minus hat sigma two over y s two? It is in fact 0.20. And you just multiply by 100, and then you would get 21%. Okay, so that was all pretty straightforward. I don't really have any questions about it. Sorry, I, I do actually have a question there. Um, oh, okay. So, so um, the sigma hat. Yeah. Um, is is that from the sample sample set or from the observed? Because, I mean, this is a this does have 4,000 samples in it. Right. Um, yeah, 7,000 rule, technically speaking. I thought it was for the observed, but that was what they estimate based on the observed. Because it, because to me, that reads as um, yeah. one minus um, the observed um, uh, uh, residuals uh, divided by the um, sample, divided by the sample residuals. Yeah. It's probably a good, relevancy. That's a good point. This is the variance of the sample data. This is Oh sorry, the, like uh, if you look at the yeah. if you look at the code, it basically says posterior samples for the yeah. model, and then summarize is so right here. Yeah. Hat sigma two is median sigma two. And then pull. So yeah, that's um, yeah. So it's just taking the median of that. Uh, oh yeah. Square. So yeah, yeah. So of the observed, so the sample variance. So it's using the sample variance as the total. Right. Um, the uh, the uh, denominator. Yeah. So from our original data set, what was the variance? Um, and then yeah, we just said from our uh, samples that yeah our posterior predictions um what did we see yeah that's a, that's quite interesting yeah. actually posterior so it, samples it, yeah versus yeah. the actual observed variance yeah that's that's pretty cool um it still adds up to about 21 percent, which is which is nice and then they interpret that in the book as basically well you wouldn't want necessarily maternal um, education to the uh, the be all and end all of uh, child's education. Right, right. So, um, so twenty one percent. Yeah. 
a lot of times with your uh, soci sociological and psychological studies, you don't necessarily expect to see a, a very large R squared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of the nature of the, the data, I guess. I, I remember publishing one with 11%. 11%, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't good. Well, I mean, it was, it was good. <laughs> It was considered good. Well, that's again, it's a context thing, right? That in the context of the study, it, it was, yeah, a valuable result. Um, Anyhow, so the Bayesian R squared is a bit different, isn't it? I believe so. Yeah, because he's saying this isn't a classical model, but we can do, yeah, this. So, yeah. That's a good point too. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Bayesian R squared. So yeah, difficulties in interpreting residual standard deviation and explaining variance. Okay, it's not clear whether the authors provide the code. I'm gonna look real quick at 11, 15, oh yeah, 11, 15, 16. It's, um, this is not good, <laughs> but there you go. Uh, yeah, what we they're demonstrating there is that when you take a sample of the data, the um, the model basically stays the same, but the R squared of the explanation completely changes. Ah, uh, yeah. Which in a way doesn't make any sense. The R squared is actually pretty crap, <laughs> which is- um, Yeah, the I point, mean, the general the point I'm trying to make today. Yeah, the general guidance I've got is is really not to get too hung up on R squared. I mean, it's good to know, but yeah, there's definitely other things you should look at. I, I mean, we work we work in predictive modeling, don't we? Um, yeah, so when you evaluate. Well, yeah, then it's like yeah, it's like kind of what is your goal? Is your goal accurate predictions? Is your goal explanation? Yeah. In, in inference, R squared is probably more important because you're looking right. at future predictions. Whereas in um, in prediction, we're tending to look for accuracy in future predictive performance. So the right. RMSC is far more important because otherwise, you end up picking, typically speaking, a worse model with prediction. Mm -hmm. I mean that that's from the kind of like normal way of thinking about things as opposed to the Bayesian way. Um, but I, I, I mean, I suppose you could argue that cross-validation in a way is a form of Bayesian analysis. Yeah. Anyhow, sorry, uh, I interrupted. Um, oh, so that's good. Um, yeah, so let's see, what does this say? Make the simulated XY data based on the code. I'm not sure what he's referring to here, RD squared, <laughs> RMD. Um, but what do we have? Uh, just one to five minus three, and these values minus three. Did it with OLS. Check the summary. What do we get? That's just a, a yeah, basic linear model, ordinary least squared. So if you look at the bottom of the output, classical R squared is 0. 0.766 right here. It's not significant though, because the um, what's it? Error terms are too high. Uh, yeah, those are some. If you want to get into the fact that yeah. significance is and is important or not, right? Right here, we've got a p value of one point oh five one. Um, so let's see what he did here. He said, "Okay, now they said um, he being this uh, gentleman that." did this notebook or, or our markdown file. So they're saying, okay, so let's do this with strong priors. So we're constraining this to be normal mean of zero, uh, standard deviation 0 0.2, uh, 1, 0.2 also. So pretty tight. Um, let's see, the prior for sigma. Okay, so we just go with the default for that. Uh, so then we say get prior, uh, this is the data, this x, y. And then we have the family's Gaussian as we have had before. And y fitted, yeah, predicted by x. So what do we know? Um, the prior class B, class B, so student T. So this is just summarizing, um, I guess, all of this. Yeah, it's essentially taking the data from um, the 
the same data is, is in that model, isn't it? So you can see above the intercepts 0, 0, 0, the standard deviation is 0 0.2. Yeah. So put those into the prior information. Well, so yeah. I'm not sure where they got that one from. I'm not sure either. Yeah, why would you use uh, the one? Hmm, hmm. Oh, well, I guess we, we think it's probably, yeah, along the <laughs> diagonal. Um, and we would expect that to be zero based on that we know that we were kind of uh, just pre presenting that. Um, so let's see, prior flat. I'm not sure I fully understand what's going on here, to be honest. This display here. This is interesting. I've never seen this before. Yeah, I haven't seen him do this. So, so what is he doing then? He's saying, okay, so, oh, I see. So he's, uh, ah, um, it's, it's kind of working out from the data set based on a Gaussian family, the relation, the kind of like prior information of X, Y, and X, I think. Mm. Uh, so it's getting that information that he can then put into the model. It looks like different data has gone into it. Yeah, see, I'm not really seeing the correlation here. Mm. Um, yeah, it doesn't work for me either. Yeah, this might be one to revisit. <laughs> so this is, what section is this? Uh, 11, 6. I might just make a little note to myself. 11, 6, 2. Um, OK, so I do understand what he did here, because this is exactly what was stated up here. So yeah, it's just this is how he expressed normal 0 0.2 classes intercept. Because yeah, B not beta not, sorry, not B is your intercept. And then um, prior here, normal 1.2 classes B for your beta. Uh, I still don't so understand why he's got one from there, because his B his beta one coefficient doesn't line up with the same data as what's in there. Let's see. I think it was, yeah, I, oh, X is negative two. Well, that's as we'd expect. Um, Unless he's so, taking it from the actual data itself. Yeah, I, th I think he took it from the idea. Yeah, I, I, I'm, okay, I'm not 100% sure I'm following him right there either. Because it's like, why would you say your your prior for this is is one unless you just say, oh, I was, I was basically adding noise <laughs> to the yeah, something with the slope of one. Um, okay, so based on our prior, after we do our fit, we print it out. So then we see, okay, that's pretty close to zero. This is, you know, kind of close to one, pulled down a little bit. Um, da, da, da. So he's saying, let's next visualize the OLS and Bayesian fits with figure 11.16. So I'm looking at 11.16 real quick. So yeah, so they were just saying, the first one that they have is the actual data from survey of adults. When they do that, they have the R squared equals 30%, but if they restrict the data, they see it even smaller R squared. Um, so let's see, which is, I guess you would kind of expect. Um, so why don't we work backwards here? We'll, we'll take a look at, at the plot and then decide kind of what the plot's telling us. So, so we don't really have many data points. Um, our ordinary least squares is giving us this. Our prior was, we, I guess basically we said, oh, I, I believe this is true. So mm -hmm. that's where we had the one, yeah, so the mean was one. Um, and, and so then the posterior, when it observed the data, it says, well, actually, I'm going to adjust that downward. Um, and then we have our fun spaghetti plot over here, which, you know, will just show just lots of different lines from that pool and give you kind of a sense of what 
Yeah, the variation. Yeah. And it's shown that by doing that, you get actually a more accurate model out of it. Right. So your R squared, so your Bayesian R squared, I suppose in mm -hmm. theory, is going to be a better, um, how not Bayesian R squared, what we're looking at. Variance explained. Yeah, so it is our, we're looking at the Bayesian R squared, I suppose, in a way, which is the variance mm -hmm. explained is going to be a more accurate um, explanation of the model, not just uh, the model fit in general, not just the fact that it captures enough variance. Is right. that what you're saying? Okay, the standard deviation of fit, yeah, well, standard deviation of the data is only blah, blah. So the square is greater than one. Aha. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> so the standard uh, deviation for the fitted values is going to be 1.3. And the standard deviation of this. Okay, so he says we define it by a different formula. So we say the alternative R squared is the explained variance over the explained variance plus the residual variance. So what happens then? Okay, you could compute that. Oh, so they have a built-in function. Always nice. Um, what does it tell us? So we do that. We apply Bayes R squared. And, and so we get the estimate uh, not greater than one. <laughs> so that's good. Um, it, it wouldn't be, obviously, because of the definition. Um, so yeah, so that gives you a sense of, of both the, yeah, the, estimate and then the error and just sort of the band that it would live in. Okay, so if you set your summary as false, you get a vector of posterior draws for plotting. So what is he doing here? He's saying, um, so here's our fit M10.3, and that one's hovering around this 0.2, and then 11.7, which is the one we just did, that's kind of interesting that it's, uh, yeah, it just kind of comes up against 0.8 and just stops. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. What do you make of that, uh, August? Well, in the book, what he says is instead of working directly with 11.1 uh, with or 11.2, we define R squared explicitly based on the predictive distribution of the data. Mm -hmm. using the following variance decomposition, which as we look up above. That was this, yeah. Um, yeah, so. Explain or uh, ex explain plus residual, yeah. Yeah, explain variance divided by explain variance plus residual variance, which is, you know, typical. Uh, so basically it's all of our variance. Uh, so that's the uh, total squared, some squares, isn't it? It all would be in a normal situation. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the... Bayesian version, it's different, isn't it? Because of what have they done? Um, explain very So, because they didn't do the summary, they've got yeah, just the, all the posterior draws, so you can make plots like this. I just find it interesting that it has this shape. It's just a very strange shape. <laughs> yeah. A weird one. This one seems like the sort of thing you would see. Yeah, I, I wonder about that. Oh no, where'd Pavitra go? She dropped off. <laughs> oh, wait a second. Um, so 11.7 is the um, Bayesian, is the Bayesian model and 10 is the normal model. Yeah, I think 10 is the one that has to do with the one we just did. Take a look real quick. So that one might be going back to, to previous. Let's just look for it. I feel like it's a bit disconnected here. Um, yeah, the multivariable, yeah, that's the kids' uh, high school, yeah. Um, what's the value? It's 10. 
isn't it for the uh for the r squared value sorry about 20 for the r squared value for that. it was about 20 which 21. is what we had, had seen before that makes sense so yeah so this this one i totally understand um this one i'm yeah a little bit baffled by the shape of that it's curious it's much sparser data for one thing so that was interesting um yeah and then we used a prior, we, we had kind of had given it a prior that we believe to be true. Uh, is it, okay, so here, maybe is, no, that doesn't, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to think of why that would be. It doesn't show. Why this. it would just like drop, <laughs> there's like no tail this way. It's just It weird. doesn't show this in the book. Um, yeah, I think this it's is, just cut off the, I think it's just cut off the high end. This is something he did. Yeah, so, um, okay, so there's facet, facet wrap. Yeah, it's possible if you just cut off the high end. It, I mean, it appears to be so, because if you look at the other model, it only goes up to 0. 0.8. Yeah. So I suppose the only thing would be to, like, replicate everything that he's done, but then you'd have to pull out all the data. Yeah, we would have to look at these. Um, because it's not that easy to just undo a, a, a knitted uh, markdown. Yeah, you can't just do, 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 <laughs> click on it. And It'd be it nice out. if you just couldn't turn it into an R script. Um, yeah, yeah, just make it the interactive. I hate markdown. <laughs> don't, don't, I kind of like it. I don't know. <laughs> it's good for uh, presenting things or, or packaging up things. If you know. um, let's see. Uh, yeah, that's very strange. Hmm. What we can do, um, I guess we could kind of maybe just put a little placeholder on that one. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we're probably just getting stuck on this. And I'm not yeah, sure we don't want to get, um, get kind of important. Um, yeah, so external validation, checking fitted model and new data. Um, mm -hmm. Let's read this bit. The most uh, fundamental way to test model is to use it to make predictions, obviously and then compare to actual data, which is kind of what we do anyway. Um, 11.19 illustrates that, illustrates with children's test scores, which was fit to data collected from children who were born in 1987. Having fit the model using STAM GLM, we then use posterior predict to obtain simulations representing the predictive distribution of new cases. We apply this model to predict children outcome born in 1987 or later. Though I believe I understand how to do this, in principle, it's not clear uh, to my, to me, how Gelman et al. did this with the actual data that they provide. First, their model that they're referring to is what we call M10.3. Again, here it's a summary. Right. So, yeah, the high school IQ one. Mm-hmm. So we glimpse. What does what did the original data look like? Looks like this. Okay, so none of the variables in these data give us a clear way to predict outcomes for children born at a later date, true, or in a different age range, also true. Um, we can still use posterior predict to simulate Y new for children who have the same such and such as in the data. With this information I have, here's about the best I could do for figure 1119. Now let's see, what was... Sorry, so what he's saying is you can't predict... Um, let me do it to predict outcomes on children born at a later date, yeah, because later date is completely, you know, time, time isn't just, it's not just passage of time, it's also completely different experience in the world, I suppose, you could argue. Mm-hmm. So he's simulating some new Y values to predict on, which is probably what they did. Mm -hmm. is it? And so the argument then is, what's the actual Y scores? What's the predicted scores in the Y? So they should see a kind of similar distribution, which is what you see on the left screen. Right, and I'm looking at the book and... Yeah, it looks uh, similar. I mean, obviously, there's randomness. 
it's a lot more variability. Oh no, it's like it's you no, know, it's yeah. It's the scale, sorry, the scale is seventy to to one hundred in the book, yeah. and on here it's twenty to one hundred and forty. Right, which is why it looks quite different. Oh yeah. Also, he's got much wider margins by looks things. I think so. Yeah, this goes for yeah. He had yeah exactly seventy two. So he was. They were really looking at only this. The end. Not the things at the edge. So uh, what you, I, I I mean I I understood this section to me yeah. um, that the kind of variability should be similar in the predicted values of actual of our actual uh, predicted values in comparison to the actual scores. Right. So here's why what would be predicted and then what we actually observe. Yeah, which is why when they are when they you know we discussed last week about the um, the residual plots and why the residual plots aren't necessarily that useful because what you're really looking for is um, linearity inside um, inside the predicted values, not necessarily inside the predictors. Mm -hmm. Was that right? That was, that I might be confusing it with uh, uh, introduction to statistical learning. Yeah. Um, Anyhow, um, but I think that's the whole point of this, really, isn't it? To say that um, you need to have a decent amount of variability, um, right? Uh, and that that variability should be similar to um, to what you've seen and you observed, so it shouldn't be completely different. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's what he's getting at. Yeah, I was just reading his the code here real quick. His wires up, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. There's some interesting code there. Yeah. I'm not like good at graphing. <laughs> yeah, I feel like there's some things I could, could pick up from here. It's like um, the dotted gray lines. Yeah. That's from his, yeah, geom each line. It's interesting how they use, um, how they use. Oh, line type the, is, the, yeah, mod the model line. in the H line yeah. section. Yeah, yeah. So just uh, one standard deviation below and one above. Yeah. So now. Yeah, Yep, cross validation. This is what we like. This is what we do on our day jobs. Yeah, this is what we need to know. Um, so, so cross validation part of the data use fit, and the rest is the holdout set used as a proxy for future data to see if we overfit. How white might we expect it to perform? Um, when there is no natural prediction test, we can think of cross validation as yeah a way to assess generalization from part of the data to another part. So if we're only looking at some of the data, how will it do on the rest? Um, different data partitions can be used. You can hold out individual observations, leave one out, or they call it Lou. It's a cute name. Cross L O O. Cross validation uh, groups leave one group out or past to predict future as we do with our forecasting, leave the future out. Um, so leave one out's kind of a classic one. So how many would you like? 20, simulate. And then he does fake data based on this y equals a plus b times x plus sigma times our norm. So yeah, that's our error. We get some residuals. Okay, so before they showed the model code, they foreshadowed the 18th case will be a little off relative to the. Uh, okay, so you see that right here. Uh, let's make an exploratory graph. So they just plot everything and then they say, yeah, they have a special thing right here. Well, this is kind of interesting. So, so they do G on point and then they do G on point, but they just say, filter that x is 18 uh, and then just treat it a little differently. 
give it the red circle. Mm -hmm. So, so fit the model with and without, which is always a good question. And that's kind of what Lee went out is doing. It's saying, well, what, what if we don't have this? What does our line look like then? Um, so if we take out, okay, so we have all and we have all minus 18. So if we have them all, you get this model. Now let's put them both on the same screen. So yeah, so, so if you take out 18, the intercept uh, differs a fair bit. Mm -hmm. And the slope is a little bit less. Uh, so yeah, you can see how it, it had some impact on what's going on. Um, so let's see, what does he say? 1120A. The signals, the main thing that changes the most, I think, there. Right. Uh, oh, sigma as well. Yeah. So sigma. Yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> um, so if we look at them side by side, so we have them all 0.99. We have we take out the wild child and it's 0.88. So yeah, that's considerably smaller uh, sigma. Uh, so figure 1120, that's the one where the line is plotted and then the uh, distribution is shown of, yeah, where you'd expect to see the error. Um, the density of the posterior predictive distributions given x is equal to 18 for each of, yeah, so it's just saying what, what do our predictions look like? And if you include 18, yeah, you see a distribution that's shifted, you know, closer to it. Uh, if you don't include 18, um, it's basically shifted and yeah, 18 looks like something you should, should never see. It looks um, a bit weird though when you take 18 out. Yeah. Because if you take 18 out, I guess it, it assumes... You're taking a chunk out of the, the density. Yeah, you would never see, yeah, that you wouldn't see that. Uh, something out, out that high. It's a good case for imputation. Yeah, for sure. So he says the densities are applied as if on their sides. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so this is an unusual way. We'll get a better appreciation for what they are with a few preparatory steps. So first let's compute and plot the predictive dis distributions given x is equal to 18 for each of the fits. So yeah, so okay, so he so here we're just looking at them side by side, not you know, sideways on a graph. And the fit for all looks like this, and the fit without 18 is is curious. Um and it shifted, I guess it shifted somewhat downward, right? Mm -hmm. Um and we see, whoa. Yeah, so Gelman's figure, Gelman and his friends. Presumes one can reasonably summarize these densities as if they were normally distributed. Uh, so let's assess the credibility of those assumptions by superimposing normal density curve based on the mean and standard deviation. So a bunch of code, and then they show what does it look like. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's pretty awesome code. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good code. <laughs> All this code's pretty good. Um, uh, yeah. but particularly like to uh, create that density function yeah exactly. um, I'd never do that um, yeah. I would have never thought to do that but it's really cool so this is a real nice trick yeah so pivot longer everything names to fit uh, group by fit uh, yeah so the fit all fit minus 18 and use the mean and these values norm blah 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 so yeah it's just fighting the you know where where would that curve lie that's that d um to me uh they look pretty good right yeah mm -hmm. well exactly it says these idealized aren't perfect well you know nothing's perfect right so but they're pretty cool um so he says let's do this for many values between zero and nine and do a plot make figure 1120a which is yeah the one in the book where it's on its side yeah oh here yeah so he just kind of this kind of reproduces what's in the book and yeah again you can see where if you include it 
shift it up, but if you exclude it, shift it down. And then yeah, the mm. this is quite well. it, yeah. I mean it's quite interesting because there's a lot there seems to be more shifts down or larger shifts down than there are. Sorry, there are three large shifts up, mm -hmm. but typically speaking, there's a lot of more there's a lot of shifts small shifts down I right they must even themselves out i guess so there's enough shifts in the other direction that they balance out yeah because hmm. yeah right here it's just it'll, it'll just say it just says do this but for everything so um if you leave one out uh you get a very high residual for this guy if you leave it out sorry hmm. um same with uh, this item, this item. But then, yeah, and, and it kind of jibes with what we see. But yeah, you'll get some that are a little bit pronounced. Which kind of gives you a sense of how much influence they have, I guess. I don't know. Well, he's, using, he's used a very small data set, hasn't he? Which, uh, yeah, so you're going to see, yeah, some... Yeah, because if you were talking about, like, say, uh, what's it, a uh, one hundred point data data set, it's going to be a lot less dramatic, and right. actually probably not that significant. Probably see, yeah, quite a, a lot with less pronounced shifts. Shrinkage. Um, well, it's not shrinkage; it's just yeah, the difference if you leave it out. Uh, so in statistical notation, we could describe posterior predictive distributions highlighted in the left panel here as the probability of y nu given x nu is equal to, and yeah, basically just summing over everything. All right. So we have, you know, our different samples, and then what were our parameters for the sample? What's the probability? Um, so the various levels of S, yeah, or I guess, yeah, not sample, simulation draw. And we implicitly presume the posterior predictive distribution is normal by considering the parameters in terms of beta s, which define the mean, and sigma s, which defines standard deviation. Okay. Um, so we already kind of talked about the right panel. So Lou predict <laughs> is um, expected values from the model, excluding the held out point. So those residuals are the values when subtracted from the data generating values. Um, the residuals all have larger magnitudes. Reflected is more difficult to predict something that was not used in model fitting. Okay, fair enough. I think we all we kind of understand that. Um, so the standard deviations for the two kinds of residuals, fake data, pivot longer, moves to kind. And yeah, so basically groups by what kind of residual is it? Uh, so yeah, so um, the leave one out, this is a little, you know, it's considerably higher, I guess this is not too surprising. Um, and if we focus on point estimates, here's the Bayesian R squared for the full model and the leave one out. So what is he doing here? We've got the, yeah, so the variance yeah. of the fitted values, the variance of the residuals and the variance of the fake residuals. Which kind of are, is one of the reasons why we don't tend to use leave one out. Um, yeah. Anymore. Because uh, we find that if you do k-fold cross-validation, it kind of makes up for some of this. Bootstrapping is also right. a superior method, isn't it? For this kind of particular reason, because if we keep take, if we take pieces out, then we're dropping down the information in the model. Mm -hmm. But if we instead, if we instead take out different chunks and then combine all the different models together or get the aggregated model, we tend to get um, a more accurate model because right. it, finds the, it finds the balance through having explained all the data. Mm -hmm. Right, because all the data is is in there, but yeah, it's dressed. Yeah. Well, it is, but then we create a validation set, don't we? And validation set mm -hmm. is technically leave one out. Um, right. That's, mm, oh, mm. that makes me think about in the mind. Okay. 
So we look at our Bayesian R squared for the full model, 0.73 for the Li one out. So again, it's kind of significant difference. Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, if you're if you're if you're a if you're an undergraduate student and looking at, you're probably yeah. not thinking that's big difference. But to us, it's you know four percent is quite large. Yeah, three point. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty significant. So let's see. It's four o'clock. Let's see where we are. So we talked about what should we. We could talk about, um, why don't we talk about the fast leave one out, which is really just a paragraph in the book. Mm. Um, so it could be computed by fitting the model n times, once with each data point excluded, but this could be time consuming, yes, no kidding. Um, so the leave one out uses a shortcut that makes use of the mathematics where the posterior can be written as the prior multiplied by the likelihood, which I think he shows there, yeah. So in this case, they're saying summarize the prediction error using the log score and the deviance. Um, so let's use the log likelihood to return log of this likelihood of y given these parameters. Um, and so that's just basically applying the function to the one with all this stuff included. Uh, so this return an S by N matrix where the posterior draws are depicted in the rows and the cases are depicted in the columns. Okay. Um, so what we want, next we want to compute the average of each column, this uh, likelihood. Following the work in Vitaris, which I don't, not familiar with this one, uh, but I assume that's some, yeah, GitHub repository type of book. Uh, here's how to do so a computationally stable way. It's always good to have computational stability. So, well, yeah, because you're dealing with uh, the logs and the numbers could be extremely small for some of these. Um, so here's, we'll save the results in a column with fake. So fake LPD posterior, so I guess this is a special function to do the column log sum exps. Mm. Not totally familiar with that. Minus the log of, yeah. I think that's, uh, well, it's matrix stats. Uh, I can't yeah. say I've ever seen it before. Yeah, um, so that's interesting. I mean, um, it probably comes with base R, well, you know, with the, the standard installation. Yeah. You can see. I don't think I'm sharing my R Studio, though. I think it does. I've got it on my computer, on my, uh, on my environment. Yeah. Yeah, the matrix stats package, high-performing functions operating on rows and columns of matrices. Optimized per data type and for subset of calculations, such as both memory usage and processing time is minimized. So that's useful. Um, okay, so what exactly was he doing here compared to here? LPD posterior. Number of rows. Okay, so we save the results of this within our model fit object. Okay, I'm not sure I understand this. What is the add criterion? Do you know? Mm, well, if you look there, criterion is Lou. Great. Um, it hasn't defined Lou anywhere else. Uh, anywhere else. Okay. That must be, um, he's saying, he's adding this criteria to the model build. Uh, okay, so he's just saying add, yeah, the just to leave one out. And then he's saying, um, so if you look down below, so right. add that to the model build, and then below you've got criteria now as a selection. Then right. you've got Lou, which is leave one out, and then it's point wise. And then right. he's picking out 
individual. Um, right. Expected log density. predictive density. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I didn't get that when I saw that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm looking at. I'm looking at the book now. Okay. Yeah, no worries. I think I get that. Um, okay. So anyway, this is um, yeah. The expected log predictive density is is of interest to us. Um, so we add these two fake data and we make figure eleven twenty one. So what does that mean? Oh, log predictive density. LPD Lu. Uh, predictive density and for the posterior so again we see if we leave one out versus the posterior we'll see pretty pronounced differences for some yeah okay to see the estimate you can just use this function so they're just saying use this function against your model fit and then you're getting this, the expected log predictive density. And they use that. Okay, operate okay, instant estimates are okay. And I don't, this is interesting. So it says diagnostic values, good, okay, bad, very bad. So <laughs> here it says, okay, less than 0.7. So this is interesting. Negative infinity 2.5 is, is good, but these are okay. Um, so count percent. Yeah, so, so we have 18 that are good or two that are okay. Otherwise, none that are bad or very bad. Um, okay. Do we want to go over some more or do we want to kind of pick it up here next time, I guess? I didn't quite get this section here. Um, so summarizing, this, yeah. This section or the one that we just covered? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this this section that we just went over, summarizing prediction error using log score deviants. Um, right. So yeah, I guess we did it, kind of jump through it pretty quick. So is it is is the point of this to basically log the score Scores of the de of of deviance in the leave one out transformations. Um, sorry, in the leave one out models, in order to see, in order to basically exacerbate the difference, so that it's so that we can more easily tell whether a leave one out model is any good or not. Right. Okay, so looking at the book. I think the motivation is, he says, so residual standard deviation are interpretable su summaries for linear regression, but they do not always make sense for logistic or other data discrete models, which doesn't really apply to this particular case. But he's also saying, in addition, residual standard deviation measure, okay, so I think this is the kind of the key point, uh, measures the only the prediction error relative to the mean of the predictive distribution but that ignores the uncertainty represented by the predictive distribution. So I guess he's saying if you do residual standard deviation R squared, you're only looking at, you know, what was the mean of all your predictions and how did that fare against the real data? But here we're trying to capture, um, you know, how did it fare, including all of our uncertainty about <laughs> our predictions? Um, and the way they do that, I guess, is by looking at all the samples. Uh, yeah, so your LPD posterior. So that's the, I guess that's the motivation for it. So they're saying what, are, this is using, instead of just using the mean, we're saying, what, why don't we just use our, you know, simulations and, and see kind of how things fare based on that. Um, so we want to compute, yeah, so we're computing the average. So, so we're kind of saying, well, how well did, I guess maybe what we're saying is how well did it do on average? Just the probabilities, how did they look? <laughs> Does that make sense at all? I, I, I think, yeah, I think what he's going for is, you know, if we do 
R squared and residual standard deviation, we're only looking at just one point, but if we do this, then we're looking at, you know, sort of how does it look probabilistically maybe? Yeah. I think I need to reread this section. And yeah, I mean, maybe I'm, that'll I think be so. like what we can do and, and kind of pick it up, maybe even just pick it up here and just kind of go over. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense what you're saying. Um, yeah. It's I was trying to see what is the motivation for what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's it. I mean, I can't say that I tend to usually want out cross validation, uh, unless, of course, you include talking about um, what's it called? A validation set. Which is, I suppose right. we all do. Um, well, right. certainly not, not like that anyway. We tend to use, uh, what's it, K folds, don't we? K folds, yeah. Cross validation is kind of the bread and butter. It's how we do it. <laughs> yeah, we don't really, yeah, I don't, I don't think in practice you, you would do leave one out a lot. Um, Let me get to it. Uh, uh, K fold yeah. is on page 178. So, yeah, it does come up. Yeah, if I re I'll reread those sections for next week. Um, right. Uh, I'm gonna put my bookmark here so that we know where to uh, start. Yeah, I forwarded the page, um, and then I'll read chapter twelve as well, because um, I've got nothing else on this week, and that should um, get us through the transformation exercises. Sorry, transformations and regression. I mean. That probably should be very similar to parametric, really, isn't it? You could have bailed out on us. I hope uh, Pavitra wasn't uh, <laughs> annoyed or something. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Um, she, she's got a very, very busy job at the moment, as far right, as right. And then she, yeah, has has the young kid as well. So yeah, yeah many demands. So yeah. yeah, having a tough time. I think. Oh, uh, ho hopefully, okay. she can join us next week. Okay, I hope so. Uh, always good to, to have more people. Um, so yeah, so I guess we'll just pick it up here next time. Well, I could I could plug the book a bit more uh, during um, introduction to statistical learning because yeah. there were there's quite a few people there who weren't. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, the Bayesian regression stuff's a lot more complicated mm -hmm. than. Uh, because when you get into parametric stuff, it is complex if you look at the formulas. But most people don't go much deeper than the general formulas. You know, even in the book, it doesn't go into the actual way to calculate the coefficients for a multiple regression. Right. So because, as I'm sure you're aware, well, it's matrix algebra, but mm -hmm. also it's kind of like, well, how do you decide which point belongs to mostly to which um how do you decide which which variants i don't know um, how uh, how do you decide what the variance in your y value belongs to or is more, mostly explained by one linear model sorry one element of your linear model over another mm -hmm. you see what i mean yeah because uh, not it's not entirely straightforward, because otherwise you just stack linear models on top of each other. But it doesn't work quite like that because you have to account right. for the fact that you've got other predictors in there. Right. Uh, anyway, so much to learn. So much, so much to learn. But we will pick it up. Um, yeah. We'll try to finish. Yeah, we'll try to certainly finish eleven next week. Oh, I think we're making. I think we're making good progress now. Um, yeah, see, yeah, we seem to be moving pretty well. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, we're just a few pages from the end, which is basically where we were last week, anyway. So it makes sense that we're a few pages from the end this right. week as well. So yeah, it's cool. Okay, thank you very much for your time, good. Stephen. Yeah, thank you, August uh, Graham. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. Peace, Bye. Yep. Bye.